for joining in this uh, in this session. Uh, we're just delighted to see the interest we have. Uh, I guess well over 120 when we last counted people from all different states and all different programs. So um, thank you for joining us, and thank you for raising this issue. That this. This webinar evolved from a question that came on our rural drug court list service to how to uh, best identify people that are appropriate for drug courts. So on our um, panel, we have uh, some of our seasoned drug court consultants. Some of you may know them. They've done uh, technical assistance as well as run their own programs. Uh, Judge Dennis Fuchs from Salt Lake City, uh, Jamie, Judge Jamie uh, Houston from Baltimore, Roger Peters from the University of South Florida, who's done so much work in treatment and um, co-occurring disorders, and Judge John Schwartz from Rochester, and uh, and Yvonne Seegers unfortunately has the flu and was not able to join us, and then turned out had a, a class scheduled, but she has uh, gone over the slides and authorized me to be her proxy. I was a public defender, not like Yvonne, but um, anyway, is, is strongly supportive of the issues that we're going to talk about. So with that, I'm going to um, go to the uh, uh, just kind of the overview of this session and then turn it over to our, our uh, panelists. The, the purpose of this session and one of the major issues we've been finding in our technical assistance um, visits to local programs is to promote strategies that provide for systematic screening of all drug court eligible arrestees and if your program is going to focus on probation violators then all probation violators. With, and to do this What's important is to have clearly articulated eligibility criteria that are clear to everyone as to what is involved in, in uh, being eligible for the program and then that they're consistently and transparently applied. And we'll talk about some of the issues that we see where uh, some of the local program procedures get in, to the, way, in the way of, uh, of, uh, of this consistent and transparent application. And the, view, the whole goal is to identify drug court eligible participants as soon as possible after arrest or their probation violation so they can be, uh, so like with any chronic disease, once their disease is diagnosed, they can begin getting treatment as soon as possible and not get further involved in drug use. And so therefore to promote their entry and engagement with the treatment program as soon as possible. Uh, Topics that we're going to address today, and we're going through them pretty summarily, so we're happy to provide uh, further technical assistance or information on them um, to anyone interested, but is the screening process. What's the purpose of screening? What's entailed? When should it occur? Clinical versus criminal justice screening, and uh, how do you use the results of the screening? And then we're also along with screening, assessment. And we find a lot of confusion uh, in the field about the difference between screening, which as Judge Schwartz will tell us, uh, should be a quick 10-minute process that occurs as quickly as possible after arrest or probation violation determination. And then we're going to look at the assessment process, how it differs from screening, when it should occur, and how to use the results. And Involved with all of the assessment process is going to be um, understanding what the definition of high risk, high need is. What are we looking for and the value of multiple drug court tracks to accommodate the range of risks and needs that we're finding. So with that, I want to turn, actually Monica, if you could go back, just one, okay, I wanted to just uh, turn this over to Judge Schwartz to see if you wanted to add anything to the overview and, and the purposes of this session, and then we'll go on to the specifics. Judge Schwartz? Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome. Uh, screening is very important in this process. In it should be done as soon as possible after the arrest. It has two components, a legal component. What crimes are eligible for the program? That should be decided in advance. And then someone on the court, drug court staff shortly after the arrest or someone in pretrial release shortly after the arrest 
should go over and screen the person to see if they're clinically eligible for the program. This screening process should be done by someone who has experience in substance abuse treatment. Okay, and then do you want to comment on assessment, the assessment process? Yes, well, some of the most uh, screening process and the assessment process are often confused. The screening process is to determine whether that person is legally and clinically eligible uh, for drug court. The assessment is a full-blown assessment which should be done by a treatment provider which tells the court, the person's dependency on drugs and the level of treatment that person needs. Okay, and thank you. And these can, and I know from our experience, we're seeing that often it takes a while to be able to get the assessments done. And so this is one of the critical uh, issues that we'll talk about what happens in the screening, and then what happens between the time of assessment. So, Monica, Carol, let's go I on. I just want to add one yeah. comment to that, though. It, it is correct. It takes a while to get the assessment done, but the screening, because it's a, almost a 10-minute process, can be done almost immediately. Right. And, um, and one of the things we find is that so many people are waiting for whatever reason, the process is, you know, waiting down the line to even be screened for drug court. Uh, sometimes they're out and sometimes they're in jail waiting for this or that, that people don't even think about drug court until, you know, weeks or months after their cases come up. So this is why we wanted to stress the importance of the screening. So, Monica, if you can go on to the next slide. Uh, the purpose of screening, and uh, perhaps Roger, do you want to start off with the purpose of screening, what it entails? Sure, and uh, as Judge Schwartz men mentioned, the screening is a great process compared to assessment. It needs to happen in a, uh, in a short amount of time so that lots of people can be screened potentially for the program. So. Um, it's, screening is really a yes-no determination of whether or not somebody is eligible for the program. And, for example, related to substance abuse, are they likely to have a substance use disorder? So part of the screening will necessarily entail uh, looking at uh, diagnostic indicators of substance use disorders in a very brief way. And we have a number of instruments that we'll talk about later that are very useful for this process. Um, and then the, the other part is, of course, the legal eligibility criteria, and perhaps the judges can, can speak to that, that uh, part of the screening process. Thanks, Roger. Could I just ask, who, who would perform, in your experience, who are people, types of people that would perform the screening? Right. So the, it, typically it's a single person. There might be several people in a larger jurisdiction that perform the screening, but uh, it's typically uh, someone who has some background in substance abuse and uh, is very familiar with the eligibility criteria for the program as well. Uh, it could be a case manager, a screening specialist for the program. Uh, in some cases, uh, perhaps in a smaller jurisdiction, it could be the drug court coordinator herself or himself that would do that. Um, it could be a task uh, staff that operates uh, with the courts uh, and is knowledgeable about substance abuse issues. So it, it's, there's not a, a single answer to that, but it typically is one or two people that uh, take on that function. Um, the interesting thing is that you don't have to have extensive uh, a training in clinical areas in terms of providing treatment or providing counseling for this population, but it does need to be people who are uh, have some ability to establish rapport and can represent the program and establish um, a connection with people um, during the screening. And if you have a pretrial service agency, they would be ideal to do that. But I think people, everyone should look at the first contact you can have with that individual when they meet the justice system, and that is where the screening should start. Do any of the other panelists have any comments, or we'll go on to our next slide? 
Um, yeah, yeah, I think that people in rural areas who maybe don't, this is Judge Fuchs, by the way, um, who don't have pretrial or they're maybe don't even have a coordinator for their uh, drug court program, um, can actually train a jailer in booking to do an initial screening. If you have objective criteria as to who initially is eligible to be looked at by your drug court program, then a jailer can go through and do a quick initial screening and then refer an individual to the program, to either defense counsel or the uh, county attorney or the district attorney, whatever you have in your jurisdiction, to continue with the criminal uh, screening and then the eventually the clinical assessment. Um, but it should be done as quickly as possible. And I think it's also important to understand that once an initial screening is is completed and they are deemed or thought to be maybe eligible for the program, um, there is no reason that individuals shouldn't be released from jail and start going to treatment and maybe as a pretrial release or as a condition of release or as a condition of bail, you also require them to take drug tests uh, for the program, even though you can't sanction them the same as if they were in the program. But the idea is to start individuals in treatment as quickly as possible. And so that initial screening should be done quickly and people started in treatment and the program as soon as possible. Carolyn, I'd like to join in if I might. Sure. This is uh, Judge Jamie Houston. Good, good morning or afternoon to everyone. And thank you so much for um, well, I need to participate. I, this portion is so critical, and we have found in traveling across the country that it is confused by a lot of programs. Screening is very black and white. It is objective. It is clear. It is transparent. There is no room for any subjectivity in the screening. So. For example, some criteria you would consider in your screening would be legal determination. What are the crimes that you will accept into the program? What are the prior offenses the person has that you would accept into the program? What is their legal back, current legal background? Are they currently on parole? Is that a problem for the program or can you accept them? Are they currently on probation, for example? Uh, and what is their general background? Are they outside the jurisdiction? Can you allow that into your program? Have they had prior drug court involvement? Is that is that an exclusionary criteria or not? Um, so it's very it's a very black and white determination, and I believe Roger said anyone can perform it. I see a question on the screen about whether the public defender can do that. And yep, the public defender certainly can. It is uh, many programs have the prosecutor do it because the prosecutor has more easy access to legal history than the other partners. But assuming one can research the person's priors that may be exclusionary and their current legal status, um, suppose they have pending cases in another jurisdiction that could cause you problems. And it really would be no, um, there would be no reason why any person who was part of the team to do that. Uh, and the last thing I will add, in addition to it being very quick, is that the person who does the initial screening is the, um, the first face that the, the candidate will see to drug court. And so it is so important for that person to have a good be able to develop a decent rapport with that person, be able to um, be motivational in their conduct, and certainly not to, to, to give the impression that they're being judgmental. So these are considerations. Thank you. The, the, yeah, this is again Judge Fuchs. The only issue I see, and I don't see any problem with a public defender um, doing the initial screening, it's just in a question of your jurisdiction, how long does it take for an individual to be appointed a public defender? How long are they sitting in jail before a public defender is assigned to them? Um, and again, the, 
we can't stress enough that screening should take place as quickly and as soon as possible um, so that individuals can start in the program and you know, whoever the public defender is in the program, uh, they can meet them for the first time when they're just observing court. Uh, also, they don't have to necessarily be assigned to that individual. Okay, thank you. Okay, Monica, you want to go on to the next? So, as Judge Houston indicated, uh, you know, one of the crit critical roles of screening is also to we used to say to capitalize on the trauma of arrest, but when people are kind of haven't settled back into their old routine, this is the opportunity to, to screen the pro to see if they're eligible, but also to uh, ascertain and try to motivate the person to be in drug court. Um, and also, we know that there's, and this is something Yvonne asked me just to really stress, to combat the distrust some individuals have in the justice system and built-in reluctance to become involved with it. And I think, just to be candid, in, in, some place, in some programs we are trying to promote a therapeutic approach so that it's not sanctions, all sanctions, it's therapeutic. Uh, it's not an automatic jail sanction if you don't do this or you don't do that. But the idea is to be holistic and, and uh, therapeutic and supportive. And in some jurisdictions we know the programs haven't been that way and so they've already on the street become, uh, do not have a, a good reputation as an alternative and often, you know, prosecutors can offer as good or better a deal. So what's the point in going to drug court even though in the long run the benefits are overwhelming. So I just wanted to kind of bring, put that out and see if our panelists have any further comment on that. Um, again, this is Judge Fuchs. I think it's important that we remember that everything an individual is usually going to hear in the jail about uh, a drug court program is usually negative because those are the individuals that have either been uh, sanctioned by the program or rejected by the program or have, or have chosen not to go into a drug court program. So as Jamie said before, uh, the individual that first meets with them is, is the first face of the program. They need to be positive about the program. And it's also important to get these individuals, again, out of jail as quickly as possible. Let them start observing drug court and seeing that there is a team that is holistic in their approach. There's a prosecutor that is concerned about them. There is a judge that is concerned about them. There's treatment that's concerned about them. I, I think it's really important that individuals who are coming into the program um, quickly get a taste of the program, get to observe it, and, and see how the program is run. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has any comments, but let's go on to the next, uh, next slide. So we also, you know, wanted to stress that the screening process, and as we've said, has to be objective. And constitutionally, um, the drug courts are, are public programs, and so the 14th Amendment requirements of due process and equal protection apply. Uh, there, we have to show a rational basis if someone satisfies the eligibility requirements and then is, is not permitted to be in the program. Um, I, want, I don't know if any of the other panelists want to comment on that, but I think the distinction between objective criteria and subjective criteria really is very um, prominent when we do many of our technical assistance visits. And so, um, I, do any of you want to comment on that? Uh, this Houston. is Judge Schwartz again. Uh, I, I, the, the legal criteria has got to be defined ahead of time, and it should be strictly objective. Uh, and the critical uh, criteria is: are those in need of substance abuse treatment? If they if they meet those two criteria, they should have an assessment to see if they should be allowed into drug court. Uh, it's very important that drug courts be open to all who could benefit from a drug court. Well, I'll jump in if I might, uh, Judge Houston. Uh, let me, I've been doing drug courts for a, a gazillion decades already. <laughs> and when I first started, 
I used to have an internal uh, voting system. I just shared it with myself, nobody else, as to who I thought would do well in drug court. And the folks who were very verbal and gave me the, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and really expressed their willingness to jump in and to do this, I always gave them high marks for graduating. And the other folks who seemed laissez-faire, who really were just there because to get out of jail, I gave them not much hope of succeeding. And I, I bet you all can imagine how my voting system turned out. It was really lousy. In other words, I, you cannot predict who will do well in drug court. The person who has been through multiple treatment episodes actually might do better than the person who has never been to treatment before. Although I have seen teams discuss, well, why should we put this person in drug court since they've already failed so many times in treatment? Actually, the research suggests the opposite. I have seen, we have all seen teams who will vote as to subjective reasons why this person should not get in, such as they come from a lousy family. When they go back onto the street from jail and they go back to their family, they will not be able to succeed. The police will chime in saying, we know this person, he's really just a hoodlum, he's never going to, or she's never going to do well in the program. And the criteria, the subjective criteria goes on and on and on that way. But the reality is you can't predict. There's no evidence to support that we can subjectively identify who will do well and who will not do well. And we have found in our travels that many, many, too many programs are interjecting their own subjective beliefs and feelings and internal um, uh, guessing as to who will do well. And we are, this panel will tell you that you cannot and should never be guessing. Use the criteria, the objective criteria, everyone then gets in, and then you do not run afoul of any equal protection. Thank right. You. If I can say something here, Carolyn, again, this is Judge Fuchs. Um, I, I've been to a lot of programs throughout the United States or, and throughout this country where the individual appears in court and the judge or the treatment team asks them, well, are you willing to come into drug court and are you willing to change and are you willing to give up drugs? And what we're asking them to do in a program that's totally based on honesty is usually lie to us with the first question we ever ask them because no drug dependent or drug addict high risk individual is really ever going to say that they want to give up drugs and they really want to change. What they really want to do is get out of jail. Um, so uh, that's probably not an appropriate criteria for individuals coming into the program. And again, to stress what Jamie said, I think it's important if you have objective criteria and an individual meets those criteria, then they are presumptively in the program. For years Years and years, we have basically said individuals are presumptively out of the program unless we, as the team, let them in. Well, it should. It, we need to change our way of thinking, and we should be thinking they are presumptively in the program unless someone on the team can articulate a really good reason to keep them out of the program. And again, that becomes an equal protection argument. Carolyn, uh, if I might, Judge Fuchs's point is so important that I, I just have to highlight it. Their motivation to change at the beginning of the program is really not important. It's our job to identify those who get in, try to, to, to encourage them to participate, and then it's our job to get them into the right treatment because the, the research suggests that the longer, the, the prediction for success is length in treatment. The longer you can keep them in the treatment chair, the more likely they will then become motivated to change. I think it is inappropriate and unfair to really expect a person, many who of these folks who have just been arrested, may be coming down from a, a high or a, a low, so to speak, on drugs, may be, uh, have, have cognitive issues uh, and a variety of um, co-occurring disorders, to be able to make a 
motivational decision at that point, at that vulnerable point in their arrest career. So I, I just wanted to highlight that so important point. And that's a critical point, uh, as, and maybe Roger can follow up on this question. One of the, the issues is that uh, it takes a while, as Judge Houston said, to actually have treatment click in. And from uh, maybe, Roger, you can give us some time frames. It seemed, I've seen five to six months. And one of the things that struck me on some of the BJA grantee reports that grantees were providing is that there's a substantial number of participants that are terminated within the first 60, 90 days, which seems to be the time when we should be working to keep them in the program because we know that that's going to be the, one of the most difficult times. I know that one of the judges tells people even after 60 days, well, it's been easy now because, you know, maybe you, you can manage to comply, but now from now on it's going to be harder because you really, um, the, the treatment and the lack of drugs is really kicking in. So, Roger, could you comment on what the research has shown in terms of when does treatment start to take its hold? Right. Well, I, I think there's not a perfect answer to that, but certainly I think you're on, on target that there, it, takes several months for people to, to gain some level of intrinsic motivation. Uh, we use ex external motivation, obviously, to start out with to coerce people into treatment to the extent we can, although uh, we certainly need to provide incentives for them to take part in the program and tell them what the drug court can offer them in terms of whether it's housing assistance, transportation, vocational programming, other things that may be more salient to them than substance abuse and abstinence at the start of treatment. But uh, it certainly takes uh, several months, typically, for people to really fully engage in our programs. And so, again, I agree with all the comments that have been made that it really is uh, counterproductive to use motivation as a uh, as kind of a uh, entry criteria to our drug our programs, given that most of our people are are not well motivated to start with. Um, that being said, I think exposure to people in drug courts, including uh, peer mentors as well as uh, counseling staff and uh, and drug court coordinators, the judge, uh, all of the staff provide a really important experience for people to get motivated, get engaged, and to develop a personal relationship with the program that then carries forward into the more internal intrinsic motivation uh, that uh, happens over time. So I think it is it does take several months, and of course it's individual specific. Um, uh, as to how that occurs, but we certainly don't expect uh, high motivation at the start of, of drug court treatment. Right. And Dr. Mealy has addressed this in a separate series of webinars we're doing. So let's go on to the next uh, slide. And um, Car Carolyn, can I interrupt for yes, a second? Yes, yeah, sure. Because I'm, I'm just looking. This is Judge Fuchs. I'm looking at one of the questions that says, you know, our courts could not absorb all who are eligible for drug court. What kind of objective exclusionary criteria would be appropriate to make sure that the program isn't too large for the amount of staff available to run it? Um, and I think that I, one of my answers is. Your, your program is controlled by how many uh, individuals you can handle in court and in treatment uh, effectively, and you can uh, expand or loosen the criteria based on the number of individuals you have in the program. I think that you can legally exclude individuals from the program if you are full and you can no longer adequately either treat or uh, supervise those individuals. So I would just say that the criteria have to be objective, but they can also be dynamic depending on um, who is, how crowded your program is, all right? And that's a really good point because I think it's important to keep track of the demand versus the ability to satisfy it because that can also promote additional resources, if you can show how many people could have uh, participated if you had the resources. So Carol, that's a very good question. Carol, well, let's get, oh yeah? Carol, just to, to, to piggyback on that, the question, there are some questions here about, you know, what do you do about eligibility? And if, if you have a very, you, you, you have a black and white eligibility criteria and you have too many people who could fit that criteria, uh, then yes, keep track so that it could eventually support the need for expansion. But in the moment, you cannot, you can't bring in more people than you can. You have resources to handle, and, and so how many programs handle that? 
as a quick answer is that you just cut it off. Say, uh, we can't take anybody else for uh, next month or two, and then you open it up again. Right. But it's also important to document that so that hmm. – it's a, it's a foundation for getting more resources if they're available. Uh, and uh, related to that, there's a question came up, beyond a prison-bound defendant unable to participate, what screening criteria do you see as valid for legal exclusion? So, um, Judge Schwartz or Judge uh, Fuchs? I, I, would, I would exclude uh, uh, sex offenses uh, uh, from the program in uh, – crimes of violence, but you've got to be careful when you use the definition of crimes of violence. Uh, many, many states uh, by statute, a certain crime is a crime of violence by statute, but there's no violence at all in the act, uh, the criminal act. Uh, you, you should put people in treatment because they need it, not because you're afraid of them. Uh, and uh, so, but certainly sex offenses, Crimes of violence that actually include violence, uh, I would exclude from the program. However, you've got to also judge your community. You know, what can you present to the community? You want community support. Uh, so uh, you gradually take more and more cases in, and you gradually widen your criteria. Okay, can I, Carolyn, this is Judge Fuchs again. I'd like yeah. to add a little bit to what Judge Schwartz just said. Um, I, I'm not sure that uh, the, the, federal, the federal government, if you're on a grant, sometimes excludes crimes of violence. However, in Utah, since we're not using any federal money, we do not exclude crimes of violence. I mean, when you say we're going to exclude crimes of violence, then you're excluding domestic violence and some other crimes where individuals may be involved in their conduct because of their addiction to substances. Um, what we say is it should be – people should be excluded – definitely for sex offenses, but they should be excluded if they are going to endanger the health and safety of your drug court staff, and that includes treatment, or they're going to endanger the health and safety of other participants in the program. So um, that's what we use as a definition of for exclusion in regards to violence. It really is the safety of the program and the safety of other participants. Um, so as a general rule in Utah, we do not exclude crime simply because it's a crime of violence. Okay? I needed to add that, Carolyn. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is John Schwartz again. Uh, uh, Judge Cruz, I agree with you, but then by doing that, aren't you getting into a little bit of subjectivity uh, as opposed to being very objective? Uh, um, someone must think that they're going to endanger the, the safety of the drug court. Uh, no, because so it has back, to be articulated. Let me just finish. I, I, I think you have to have clearly defined definition. What crimes are eligible uh, for the program? Uh, uh, name the crimes according to the how they're listed in your statutes. Well, I, I won't argue with you, but the the only crime we exclude by definition is murder or sex offenses. Are murder or sex offenses? Yeah. And I think the point is that it's. Obviously, there are going to be programs that are going to exclude certain people, but to have those exclusions uh, objectively and, and uh, recorded and not simply it was the vote of a team and the team voted you not to, uh, you know, that you weren't eligible. So I think, you know, whatever the criteria are, that they are clearly articulated either for inclusion or exclusion. So we have another question, and which goes to our next slide. What strategies can be used in the screening process to avoid screening people out of pro the program? It occurs to me that high-risk, high-need criteria often confuse programs and keep participants from entering the program. So, Monica, can you get to the next? You're at the next slide. Thank you. So here we get to the definition of high-risk, high-need, and this is one that um, we also find very confusing uh, or confused among many people. Uh, what are we looking for and uh, and then how do we 
utilize multiple drug court tracks to accommodate the range of needs and risks uh, we're identifying. So, Roger, I guess we'll start with you um, in terms of what does the literature say about the definition of high risk, high need? So yes, I, I agree. These are controversial issues and important ones. Uh, I think in terms of high need, uh, we're really talking about the high need for substance abuse treatment as defined by moderate to severe substance use disorders, right, by uh, DSM criteria. Um, otherwise, if people don't have a, a somewhat severe substance use disorder, they probably don't need intensive outpatient treatment that drug courts provide. And so we also know from literature if you mismatch people who really don't have a major substance use problem, then you can actually cause uh, negative outcomes. So that's, I think, the definition of high need, again, coming to a, uh, looking at uh, the diagnostic indicators for a substance use disorder among people who are accepted to drug courts. As far as high risk, it's probably a little more controversial in terms of what we mean there, but uh, generally we're talking about the high risk for criminal recidivism or rearrest. And that's usually determined by a combination of factors that have been shown by the research to influence criminal recidivism. And those are both static factors, things that don't change, such as age at first arrest or number of prior felony convictions, um, and also dynamic factors, which are things that are changeable that we can intervene uh, with in drug courts. And those are things like uh, substance abuse, uh, but also education, employment, antisocial uh, personality features, attitudes and beliefs, as well as antisocial peers, uh, social support, those kind of things. And so to really determine high risk, uh, we use a standardized risk instrument that incorporates both the static and dynamic factors and gives you, in most cases, a score uh, that would be tell you whether somebody's a high, medium, uh, low risk for criminal recidivism. Um, and then um, uh, I think the key is uh, there's a number of different types of instruments. There's screening instruments for risk that some drug court programs use to actually determine whether people are eligible for the program. And probably more likely people use a risk assessment that's done after they're matriculated to a drug court program to look at the profile of different risk predictive needs that should be addressed in drug courts, such as the ones mentioned, employment, intensive substance abuse services, education, family supports, and so forth, as well as antisocial peers. Um, so I think in both cases, uh, it's really important to look at high risk and high need for our population in determining who's a good fit for the drug court programs. Thank you, Roger. And just so everyone knows, we've had quite a discussion on defining risk and need because uh, it's an example of kind of semantics that are used in one discipline that then carry over to another with a different connotation, like case management has a different man connotation for treatment that versus judicial administrators. So this concept of risk um, has been you know, with, with all the validated instruments usually applied to sentencing and determination of, for release, and the bottom line is the commission of new offenses. But I'm just going to quote from Doug Marlowe's 2012 fact sheet, which provides a definition of high risk, high need in, in the context of the drug court. And he talks about uh, more than two decades of research indicates what types of adult offenders are most in need of the full complement of services embodied in the 10 key components. These are the individuals who are, one, substance dependent, and two, at risk of failing in less intensive rehabilitation programs. Drug courts that focus their efforts on these individuals referred to as high risk, high need offenders reduce crime approximately twice as much as those serving less serious offenders and return approximately 50% greater cost benefits to their community. So he's defining it in terms of uh, substance risk of failing less intensive rehabilitation programs. So I wanted to ask um, our other panelists uh, it, what you look for uh, in terms of um, risk and need when, when, when you're looking at a candidate who is 
been screened and eligible for the program. So maybe we can start with Judge Schwartz. And I noticed that we have other judges on this uh, session. So Judge uh, Cohn and Judge Collins and others, if you have any comments, please send them in. We'd love to hear from you. So let's start with Judge Schwartz. What do you look for in terms of okay. high risk, high need? Okay. Well, I look for, and I, and I go with uh, Dr. Peter's definition, we are a criminal court. So the first thing I I am mindful of is public safety. So, and, the, and I want to sell the program to the community, so I look for risk of rearrest. That's a very important uh, issue in our court and need for treatment. Uh, but we must be mindful that uh, we are here to promote public safety and we are here to try to reduce crime in our communities. Okay, uh, Judge Fuchs and then Judge Houston. Okay, I'll, I'll go next. This is Judge Fuchs. Um, I agree that public safety is a main issue. However, we also need to remember that if we're running these programs, drug court programs properly and according to evidence-based practices, um, we are doing very intensive supervision of these individuals. They're getting much more intensive supervision. They're getting home visits. They're getting three UAs a week. Um, they're seeing a judge every week or every two weeks. That this is much more intensive than most probation, um, other probation really is. So that um, I think public safety is an issue, but in reality, you can sell the program because this is more strict, super, more, it's a stricter supervision than they would be getting if they were on normal um, probation. But I, I think it's also important that when we talk about um, high risk, it isn't just um, number of prior offenses or likely um, likeliness to reoffend. There are some individuals out there who are arrested for the first time, and if you look at a number of the risk factors, such as age of when you first started using drugs, um, family connections, do you have family connections, do family members use drugs, the friends you hang out with, the educational level that you have, have you held a job, um, you may end up with an individual who who actually is arrested for their first time because they've just been lucky um, or they were a juvenile previously, but they're arrested for their first time for a felony offense and they may still end up high risk even though they don't have um, a criminal record. And in, in regards, just to answer one of the questions, that may be exclusive or it may exclude a lot of individuals who are still high need but lower risk. And nobody is saying that those individuals shouldn't be treated or offered an opportunity to be treated or a program. However, if they're not high risk, but they're high needs, usually you don't need as intensive supervision in the community as you do with the high risk offender. Um, the judge doesn't need to see them as often. Probation maybe doesn't need to do home visits. They don't need to be given as many UAs, maybe just brought into, into court when they do something wrong. Usually these people are more self-motivated and are willing to um, go to and receive treatment than the high risk individual is. So nobody is saying don't exclude them. They, but Doug Marlowe, if you've listened to him, they should never be handled the same. They shouldn't appear in court at the same time. They shouldn't necessarily be in treatment together, but um, you can still deal with them in another track or a different judge. All right, Jamie, it's your turn. Yeah, this is Judge Houston. Uh, I'm actually looking for the worst of the worst. If you're not worse, I, I really can't afford to have you in the program. Drug court is very expensive and it's extremely intense, and we do best with the people who are at, who for, with everything else has failed. So I'm looking for the people who have the worst records that fit in our criteria and who have very, very serious, serious drug addictions. Now, having said that, um, it is also census run. When my census is lower and I can afford to take other people, then I, I still will only take high risk, high need. And I really only know that until after, after the assessment, not before. But if I have enough open slots, then I am looking at the person who fits the de definition of high risk, high need, but who might be a first offender, 
because they just haven't gotten caught, but they've still been addicted for many, many years, and they've just been savvy enough not to get caught. I'm also very concerned about the youngsters. So if it's an adult drug court program, youngsters are 18 to 25-year-olds. They have all other kind of needs and risk issues and factors, and they are our future. So I really do like to concentrate on that population because if, if no one else could help them, drug court might. Um, so that's the, those are the kinds of things that I might look at. And, and Jamie, that was very important for you to highlight the special issues that the young adult population presents because they will often uh, and have often tested out as low risk, low need, because they don't have extensive criminal history. Um, they don't have the perception of significant drug use, even though on digging, and Roger, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they often have mental health and uh, other related developmental issues. So this also goes to the value of multiple drug court tracks uh, where someone can come in on one track where they don't demand all the intensive resources, but then as they progress, maybe they'll do fine and um, and maybe they'll need more intensive services. And I wish, uh, I know Judge Cohn has a special, has developed a four-track program in Miami that addresses that specific issue, and I'm not sure if there's a way to have her talk on this, but uh, in any event. Uh, While you're figuring we, out if she can speak, we, we did that as well. We, we had a special track for the young adults. They were still considered high risk, high need by our assessments, but we had special programs for them, uh, beating, we tried to target assessments that would be uh, more appropriate to them, and we would have special specific meetings just for the youngsters, as I call them, uh, the young adults, uh, and they seemed to have appreciated that and it worked well. And I know that uh, uh, Jeff Kushner was also on this um, webinar, has developed, at least when he was in St. Louis, a special track for the young adults, and, and that's what we know is needed in so many other programs. Uh, um, it, and, and also, Carolyn, in Utah, in Salt Lake, we have uh, actually an extra judge doing a special track of young adult offenders um, who are lower risk, higher needs. So we also are trying to accommodate them. And we just got a note from Judge Cohn who said, in the beginning of treatment, I monitor my high-need defendants very frequently because these individuals have severe substance abuse and are mental health issues. These individuals have difficulty accessing services. Um, so, and, and we can follow up with more discussion on this because this is a critical critical area. Um, uh, Allison West from San Francisco raised a question, uh, let me just get this here, um, about screening instruments. Um, Roger, is there a particular screening instrument that you recommend? Particularly I think her question about is about risk assessment, right? She, uh, excuse me, risk assessment instruments for pre-plea defendants. And I'm not sure whether that really makes a difference. Does it make a difference whether they're pre-plea or they've already been, are they probation violators or convicted? There, there are some instruments actually developed for that setting. The Ohio Risk Assessment System, for example, has a, uh, has a uh, pretrial screening instrument specifically that's been, um, uh, has been developed with that and and uh, uh, tested with that population. But um, I think there's a variety of, of risk screening tools for pre-plea defendants that might be used um, at the RANT. Uh, the, some other people have mentioned the uh, COMPASS, the LSI, or uh, each of these instruments has a screening version, for example, that could be used uh, at that point in the process. Um, as well as Actually, a more detailed instrument for assessment. Yeah. Um, it, 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 Carolyn, this is Judge Fuchs again. If you go to the, the national standards that have been adopted, at the end of each of the standards, if you look at the screening standards, there's actually a list of screening instruments that have been validated for certain things. So if you just um, go into the web and look up uh, national drug court standards, they are in there at the end okay. of each section. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, which is the assessment process. And uh, 
these questions, when should it occur, who does it, how are the results used, how does it differ from screening. And we know from our experience with technical systems that this is where there's a big, big variation among programs. Uh, some programs are dependent upon a certain agency doing the assessment, they're backed up or whatever, and so weeks if not months can occur. And uh, so this is an issue that we're, we need to address. So Roger, I'm going to turn it over to you to comment on it and, um, and then we'll have others also join in. Well, yeah, it's a really important uh, point. And I think, Carolyn, you mentioned earlier that uh, drug courts can get hung up on if they conduct an assessment prior to program matriculation. So the assessment really needs to occur after the screening and, certainly, and after people have been placed in the program. If you wait for a full-blown comprehensive assessment, first off, you don't need that. As we mentioned before, you just need a basic uh, objective eligibility screening for people to get into drug court. But after they're enrolled in the program, then is the time for the assessment to occur. And that is usually done by clinically trained staff. It's optimally done by somebody who's certified or licensed professional with training in substance abuse, mental health, other areas. Um, and it looks at things like level of care using the ASIM criteria. Does the person need uh, detox or residential or outpatient services? What kind of specialized needs do they have that uh, otherwise might undermine treatment, such as mental health? treatment, uh, treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder or trauma, those kinds of things, uh, a range of things that affect treatment or that could inhibit involvement in treatment, right, such as um, things like substance abuse history, their treatment history, mental health history we mentioned, other things like transportation and housing are critical, right, that might otherwise undermine involvement in treatment. And these are all the focal areas for assessment. Uh, certainly the assessment process is longer, it takes several hours typically, of, and it looks at multiple areas as we just mentioned. Um, it, uh, we probably should indicate there are separate instruments that are used for assessment clearly than are used for screening. Um, and that the outcome of this is a treatment plan, right? That's a specific behavioral goals that are identified for the particular individual that's not a cookie cutter approach. Uh, that also speak to supervision as well as treatment. And uh, there are definitely some individualized goals in each of those areas. Uh, we might also reiterate that the, the assessment process might include risk assessment to examine the profile of different needs related to risk for recidivism that, that if addressed in the program, lead to much better outcomes for individuals in terms of uh, reducing rearrest. So here's a question, and I know some of some programs are, it's a kind of a catch-22. So if we're not going to have people enter the program until they're assessed and we determine whether they're appropriate for the program, and entering the program might require a plea, uh, who does the assessment if in your jurisdiction only probation does assessments, but the probation uh, only deals with people who are convicted? Uh, so, anyone have any thoughts on how to address that situation? I think it was... Well, uh, what we do in Rochester is we screen them for eligibility, uh, legal and clinical eligibility for drug court. Uh, once we enter them into the program with the consent of their defense attorney, they take a plea and agree to be assessed and follow the treatment plan that the assessment determines is necessary. The screening is objective. The assessment is a treatment plan which is subjective. If after the assessment is done uh, and the person is not appropriate for drug court for whatever reason, he or she may withdraw or plea. This is Carolyn. The, the, the beauty of drug court um, folks like ourselves is that we all think outside the box. And there is no right way to do it. There is no one way to do it. Uh, as many programs there are, are permutations. Uh, in, my, in, in my city, a pro, pro, probation department has been trained clinically to administer the assessments. But of course we're doing it before they get onto probation. They've agreed to participate in drug court by giving that function to us. Um, so you, you work deals with <laughs> the different agencies that are, are going to participate. For treatment providers, 
Um, many of them do the assessments. Uh, not everybody might join into the drug court and may not get into the, or might withdraw from drug court after a fashion. So what, what the, the key is is that not so much who does it as long as they are clinically trained because uh, garbage in, garbage out. This is what's going to dictate um, the kinds, of, the treatment plans, the case management plans to some extent and how the court is going to monitor their progress. And if we don't really know what their needs are uh, and we're not addressing them, then we, we've not accomplished our task. Okay, and, and uh, Carolyn, this is Judge Fuchs again. Um, we tried to get the assessment done within the first three weeks that they are, um, after they've been screened eligible, try and get the assessment done within the first three weeks that they are actually in court observing three sessions of drug court. If we can't um, and somebody ends up pleading into the program or comes in as a condition of probation um, prior to the assessment and we make a determination that there are mental health issues or issues that we can't handle or they're not eligible for the program, we do the same thing as Judge Schwartz does. We allow them to withdraw their plea with no prejudice and then their case gets moved back to the regular criminal calendar and proceeds as usual. Thank you, and it's really important because I've seen this in the case law where someone enters a plea with the idea they're going to go into drug court, then for whatever reason they're not accepted into the drug court, and in the appellate courts that I can recall, they have not permitted them to withdraw their plea. So it's very important to have all these details worked out. But I hope that's given some of you some ideas. It's kind of, as Judge Houston says, it's working outside the box. So whatever is going to work in your jurisdiction, if you can get people to bend and agree to do something that normally they don't do, that's great. If you have to work it another way, um, just kind of a, 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 exploring all the options. I did want here's an um I did want to mention something that Judge Cohn also um noted and uh on that young adult group and that um she indicates, which I know is very important, that that uh, she has a, a grant for multi kind of multi systemic therapy, much as what you use for juveniles for the 18 to 25 year olds and it involves strong family involvement in the drug court in the hearings and family therapy and so forth much as as I say one would do in a juvenile program but I think this is something to remember that 18 to 25 year old just because they're chronologically adults doesn't mean that they don't have the same needs so we have one more question and then I'd like to go to the next slide if assessment occurs after entry into the drug court how do you exclude low-risk, low-need people? We've always been taught that putting low-risk, low-need people in drug court has negative results. Okay. And I, this, this, is, this is Judge Fuchs. We do it by, we use the RANT. Every, um, every jurisdiction within the state of Utah is licensed to do the RANT, and that's like a 10-minute assessment. That's a risk and needs triage, um, and it, it takes about 10 minutes. Individuals do not have to be clinically trained to administer it. So um, we initially screen them so that we know that they are high risk um, before we even go any further. And actually that is done in the jail at this point uh, in the state of Utah. This is Roger Peters. Uh, I think the other piece on looking at low need and excluding those people, I think that's also taken care of by a good screening instrument, such as the Texas Christian University Drug Screen 5 or the Simple Screening Instrument or several others. Um, and it, if that's conducted, that'll give you a, a good proxy for whether or not somebody has a bona fide substance use disorder. So uh, I think you are going to exclude those people then as a result of that type of screening in conjunction with the type of screening that Judge Fuchs just mentioned for risk. And also I think building into your program that you have multiple tra tracks so that uh, not one size is not going to fit all. Uh, so if there's nothing further on this slide, let's just go to our last slide, which we wanted to um, really hone in on, and that is keeping track of the results of the screening process. And I know from just BJA's experience in trying to ask uh, 
grantees how many people are screened and what who goes in and those people that reject a program and so forth. Um, many pro programs, you know, are struggling with getting that data. So we're just laying out a few um, a few information items that it's important to keep track of uh, and. The framework for the screening should be the arrestee population or the probation violators. So that's kind of your um, your base. So how many individuals are screened and their demographics? BJ is having a, a major initiative now on looking at uh, what has been identified in some programs as racial disparity in terms of who goes into the drug court compared with the arrestee population. So it's really important to see w what is who's going into the program, who's been screened for eligibility versus the arrestee uh, population, how many then, how many actually entered the program and their demographics, how many eligible participants rejected the program and why, and that goes to a variety of reasons, but it will help you shape your program. It could be the, as we talked earlier, the person who screened them, you know, just said, you know, do you want to go into this really intensive program or you want to just take the deal and get over with? Um, and also could go to the prosecutorial policies. Maybe they're offering them better deals. So again, we need to figure out how to, how to see that information into the program. And then how do the drug demographics of the drug court, as I said, compare with the arrestee population and the po population of probation violators? And this is really important information to continually look at. Um, so I don't know if anyone on our panel have additional comments. We are, we are a statistic and result-driven um, society now. And to continue to get money, I know BJA is going to require this kind of information, but it also is important for the fairness. Uh, we, we, the courts are therapeutic programs, and we have the um, desire to reach out to as many people in need as possible. If we are really not matching our population, then it's an opportunity for self-reflection. So these, this list is, is terrific, Carolyn, um, and we, we, all are, we all should be mindful of who we're taking in, looking out, looking and considering why we're not taking in perhaps the representative class, and then continue this type of screening process for the rest of the program. If you started at the beginning, it is likely you will continue it throughout your drug court. Thank you, Jamie. It this is Judge Schwartz. Uh, it's a good rule of thumb to remember. Data equals dollars. Uh, the more people you serve, the better results, the more diverse your population is, the more likely you're going to be able to raise money for your programs. Well, thank you. Um, I wanted to just comment on two other quest comments that came in and then anyone else, we would welcome them. Um, in terms of screening, uh, Judge uh, Cohn from Miami indicated that they also use the TCUDS for uh, substance abuse. Roger, can you comment on that? Uh, yeah, I had just mentioned that earlier. The Texas yeah. Christian, Texas Christian yeah. University drug screen, and the most recent version of that is uh, TCUDS5, which is uh, uh, aligned with the DSM. Uh, five uh, set of criteria. So that is an evidence-based instrument that's been used uh, quite a lot throughout the United States with uh, drug courts and criminal justice populations. It's uh, and free, free of charge. You can download that from the TC website. And I will add that Roger did a kind of fact sheet for us uh, last year on the range of different instruments for different purposes. Uh, both in terms of a set, general assessment and then trauma and uh, some of the other factors one would want to look at. And he addresses the um, Texas instrument. Um, I also want to bring in a comment from Jeff Kushner on uh, just dealing with the 18 to 25 year olds. Uh, and he says that, you know, I'd add that the young adults' traditional self-help is usually a waste of time for them. Typical uh, drunk logs do not register with them. They're more interested in obtaining skills for work, learning communication, and social skills, uh, and, and getting into the kind of the mainstream, which we've learned that it, the 
young adult, 18 to 25 year old program needs to focus on that. But we did run into some programs where there were some serious mental health issues and substance use issues too, so uh, they shouldn't be um, overlooked. Let me see what else. Uh, okay, um, this, this is Judge Fuchs, Carolyn, I, I just noticed that Judge Cohn and I typed an answer said, you know, that they use the rant as well, but it misses trauma and mental health issues. Um, the rant isn't designed to do that. It's designed to be a quick screening instrument for risk and needs assessment into drug court, but then the assessment that's done by treatment is the one that should be, is uh, those are the instruments that should be looking at trauma and mental health issues in regards to eligibility and, and whether your program can handle those issues or not. So again, to me, that's mixing screening and assessment. Um, RANT is a screening instrument. The assessment is a more, much more comprehensive instrument that looks at those issues. Thank you. So we have a couple more questions. We have a little bit more time. What kind of criteria do you look for with standard probation violators for entry into a drug court program? Are certain violators, violations excluded from eligibility, for example, absconding or failure to report? You know, this is Judge Fuchs. Again, that would that would be an, an issue for your drug court team and your jurisdiction. Um, I, I think if you want to exclude them, you exclude them. If you don't want to exclude them, you don't have to exclude them. I, I just think that that becomes uh, an issue for each particular jurisdiction as to who they're going to come in, who they're going to take into the program. It seems to me, though, if you have a drug addict or a drug dependent individual and you put them on normal probation, they're probably going to abscond. And if you think they're not, um, or they're not going to report, and it, it, if you think that you're going to have success with those individuals, that's the type of individual that should be in drug court and be supervised more uh, stringently than, than normal probation. I, I can chime in on that too. Uh, this is Judge Houston. Uh, I, I really enjoy having probation violators in the program because it's the end of the line for them. They know it's significant time in jail if they don't do well in drug court. Not that they all do well, but uh, that they're uh, they are willing to come in more readily than the other offenders who perhaps can cut a better deal down the road. Um, additionally, um, I think that with probation violators, uh, they understand what it's going to take, they, they have a better understanding of what it's going to take to do well. Uh, and then it's up to the court to put in the, per, the, the, the processes in place to ensure that. I'd also throw out to you all, considering parole violators, um, just to give you as an example, here in Baltimore, I was able to work out a deal with the parole commission that they would give me for supervision individuals who had committed a new offense while they were on parole, but not violate them while they were considering, while they were actively participating positively in drug court. And that's been a huge success. Additionally, the parole commission is consider is allowing us to take parolees um, who meet, meet the criteria as well. Um, the otherwise the otherwise acceptable drug court criteria. So once again, thinking outside the box, there are all kinds of ways to help the worst of the worst to become the best of the best. Right? <laughs> I should have added that. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> So we have a question here, just um, does anyone know, um, is there a cost for the rant? Yes, there's a, there's a, there is a, there is a licensing fee. I don't know exactly what it is, but Utah had to pay it, yes. Okay. And then another question, are you recommending the use of the rant and a tool like the Texas uh, Christian University version 5? Roger, would that's you want to answer that? That's a question for Roger. <laughs> yeah. Well, Roger. I think that we have discussed this before, and uh, I think one of the judges mentioned before that they'd like to use a risk screen like the RAMP in addition to a, a uh, more of a high needs assessment like the TCODS 5. And so I think ideally, if you have time, it's, it's useful to be able to determine whether you have high risk, low risk people uh, who are 
who you want to place in the program and to have an instrument like the TCA 5 that tells you about the needs for substance abuse treatment. Um, both give you a, a little different information that are you can uh, it can be very helpful. Well, thank you. Uh, we have just about a couple minutes left. I want I don't I think we've run out of questions, uh, but if you have any, just send them in. And I want to if uh, our panelists want to just have a few closing words. Uh, and I'm sorry, we have such an illustrious group of attendees. I wish there was a way for you to participate, because I know you have a lot to contribute to this. But um, we can just start, start with Judge Schwartz and just go down. My words of wisdom are uh, take as many people in your drug court that are legal eligible and clinically eligible, serve all that will benefit from the drug court, no matter who they are or where they come from. Thank you. Roger? Um, I don't have a lot to add. I just would encourage people to use an evidence-based uh, instrument for screening. Um, as we discussed today, there is a monograph that just came out that was published by SAMHSA that looks at uh, screening for co-occurring mental and substance use disorders in the justice system, and that's available at the SAMHSA website. Uh, that just was published uh, the week before last. And I just want to reiterate something that we were talking about before the session and how important it is to make sure that that assessment process is thorough and matches the individual with the needs that they uh, need to address because we have so much evaluation that just focuses on how individuals do, what is the outcome of the individuals where, and we have no information as to whether those individuals or who, you know, got matched with the proper services. So the uh, assessment is really essential, and we have a separate series of webinars going on with David Me Lee, who's a psychiatrist who uh, was one of the prime architects of the revised ASAM criteria who talks about this, talks about doing time versus doing treatment. And the criminal justice system thinks in terms of time, 30 days for this, 60 days for that, and treatment with any chronic disease doesn't necessarily progress along those lines. So uh, it's really a change in paradigm. Okay, Judge Fuchs? Well, um, my advice is to look at and follow as many of the adult drug court best practice standards that you can and then make your courts as inclusive as inclusive as you possibly can and uh, just to emphasize what uh, Judge Schwartz said to take in as many people as you can uh, screen them properly and offer them the services that they need all right thank you and Judge Houston Oh, goodness, these smart guys already said it all. Just inclusion versus exclusion is really important. We, we've got the model here for how, how, how to change the worst into the best. Um, so let's try to keep our doors open. Thank you, and thank you all. This has been a, a fabulous group of people um, involved, and uh, we can provide technical assistance to you if there's some tweaking or some review of the process that you feel would be helpful to get that early screening and early uh, entry into the program. So thank you, everyone, uh, and I hope you have a nice rest of the day, and feel free to follow up if there's anything else that comes up. Okay, thank you. Bye.